Hello, everyone. This is Tulce Eral, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the final panel session in the online conference under the viral shadow. The conference under the viral shadow started at 11 a.m. in the Berlin time with the introduction of co-curators Regina Rapp and Christian Deluz. So far, we welcome Vivian Su, Anna Dimitriou, and Alex May in panel A, Sarah Grant, an academic contribution by Christina Oetmeyer and Daniel Vasiliev in panel B. After a lunch break, our conference program resumed with a keynote by Roberta Buinay, and now we are in panel C, titled On Artificial Intelligence. Uh, two of the artworks in the exhibition focus on AI, particularly speech to sound and text to image technologies, and their usage as an artistic tool. Um, first, Benjamin Bacon will introduce his work, Probe 2, Subaudition. Afterwards, we welcome Jean Krogan, who will talk about the project Abraham. In our panel discussion, we are also happy to welcome Alexander Koenig, who will talk about the technical realities of artificial intelligence and examines the subfields of machines. And lastly, the screen will be Kata Spils, who will discuss and challenge the binary gendered social and cultural structures, as well as technological infrastructures. Before I leave the screen to Benjamin Bacon first, I would like to shortly introduce him. Benjamin Bacon is an interdisciplinary artist, designer, and musician that works at the intersection of computational design, network systems, data, sound, installation, and mechanical sculpture. He is an associate professor of media and art and director of signature work at Duke Kunshan University. He is also a lifetime fellow at V2 Lab for the unstable media. He is also co-founded uh, Dogma Lab uh, with his partner, uh, artist Vivian Tzu. Screen is yours. Hey, uh, let me uh, share this. Uh, can everybody see that okay? Good. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Uh, so I am going to be talking about the probe series, uh, both uh, probe series one and probe series two. Uh, so basically, the probe series is a series of mechanical sculptures that investigates and uh, speculates uh, speculative futures of uh, space exploration, colonization, and discovery through post-planetary machine life, providing a pathway and alternate forms of the panspermia hypothesis. So, uh, you know, following kind of through this thought exercise of pans panspermia, uh, which is a hypothesis that basically uh, theorizes that life on Earth originated from microorganisms or uh, other kind of chemical precursors uh, to uh, from basically from outer space. Um, and, and, you know, basically looking at this idea as an installation that speculates on the future where alien consciousness through machines uh, can basically bear these space trials, uh, you know, of, of uh, and investigate uh, different hostile environments of the earth. Uh, you know, so kind of looking at these explorations, these extra, extra planetary machine life would sense the world around it, objects, environment, language, and life forms, reinterpret what is sensed and transcode that information for other machines. <clears throat> at the same time, trying to form a commu communicative system uh, with the life forms they investigate. Uh, you know, really looking at things like the 2019 catalog, Moving to Mars, uh, Designs for the Red Planet, which was put out by, I believe, the Design Museum, and Space Settlements, which was edited by Fred uh, Sharman. Uh, they, you know, pre present really a speculative work uh, between artists and urban planners and other uh, areas and disciplines in collaboration with NASA scientists uh, in a series of kind of space habitat design and research proposals. So this was done in the 1970s, uh, but really re speaks to what we are thinking about these days uh, and the perspectives that we have these days. So the probe series is basically an alternative proposal to that, which is how mechanical or artificial intelligent life uh, in the context of planetary uh, exploration and colonization could explore, understand, and communicate 
with life and environment in basically our solar system. So it's kind of turning it around from the idea that we would, uh, when we speculate on going and colonizing Mars or other planets, but what would it be when they would come here? So probe series one really investigates how exoplanetary machines uh, uses, um, uh, so probe one basically uses computer vision with machine learning to detect objects and life forms, uh, including face and age detection to capture crowd data in its immediate environment. Probe series two, which is at uh, ALB, investigates how you can basically use and capture spoken word uh, with machine learning in its immediate environment and speculates on how basically that alien life form or that machine life form would interpret that or misinterpret that uh, human language and other types of uh, interference that could happen. So uh, just as a kind of a precedent setting here within my own series of work, uh, I wanna look at first probe series one. Uh, so probe series one was uh, collected and is on permanent display at UNART Center in Shanghai, China in 2019. Uh, so you can see here that it's actually sitting inside the, the, uh, the entryway of UN Center. Originally, it was actually planned to be outside. Uh, so the almost two meter tall uh, installation is fully weather and environmental um, hardened. So, but basically due to zoning, some zoning issues and other things like that, it had to go inside. Uh, so it was really programmed and designed to be outside and looking at the world around it. Um, so instead, you get basically the entryway and then what you can see outside of those windows. Uh, so, but as, as you can see in this screen, you've got two different cameras. Uh, so this installation basically tracks the life forms and object data of the immediate space around it, including human presence and movement, and then also other types of objects that it tracks and feeds that data back into uh, basically a machine learning model uh, that uh, develops and analyzes and then stores that in the database. So this is an always on uh, long-term installation. Um, so uh, keeping that data is actually pretty important for the generation of um, data visualizations later. Uh, so basically, there's, uh, as you can see here, there's two dual microcontrollers and cameras with machine vision algorithms uh, uh, built into the microcontroller, uh, and that's kind of the top part of the egg. Uh, and this continuously rotates for 360 degrees, capturing basically whatever it sees within that entire environment. Um, and in this case, both inside and outside. Um, you know, again, we hoped it would be something that was just completely outside so it could catch animal life, it could catch cars and other types of traffic, but instead it catches kind of half inside the gallery, half outside. So, um, so let me just play this. This is an example of the uh, data visualization along with uh, kind of superimposed on top of the uh, actual uh, people within the gallery. So there's actually somebody sitting there uh, at um, kind of the entryway, I guess. Um, and uh, so basically when it creates, so every 30 minutes, it basically takes all the data that, data that is gathered within the gallery at that point. Uh, and outside of the gallery and creates this 360 degree LED screen uh, display of, of uh, this data basically driven uh, heat map. Uh, and then it overlays it on top of each other. Uh, so this is kind of where this installation sits. So that's kind of the, an example of that. So, um, but moving on to probe series two, uh, which is sub-addition, which is uh, the two machines that are at ALB. Uh, so sub-addition is basically an act or instance of basically understanding or mentally supplying something that's not expressed. So uh, really looking at the implied meaning of words, the implied meanings of, of language. Uh, and Within that, there's ambiguity, ambiguity and basically room for artistic expression. Um, so um, 
in this series, what I decided to do was do a binary set of machines uh, and that they uh, apply machine learning methods to speech to text recognition to explore uh, this idea of sub addition uh, through the degrade, de de degradation and meaning of spoken language by decoding spoken word into kinetic energy, information transition, transmission, uh, visual representation uh, through light and color. So machine number one, uh, here's the blueprints of that, and I'm just going to actually kind of move on to the next one, uh, basically captures human uh, and directional position and environmental data, data within the uh, gallery space, and it encodes that into Morse code, which is kinetically expressed through, um, uh, let's see if I can get this to play, uh, through uh, uh, solenoids and uh, motion sensing. So basically, as you're speaking within the gallery space or in the space that the uh, probe is in, it's picking that up, trans translating that in through uh, machine learning into uh, text, and then encoding that into Morse code in which then uh, the solenoids uh, can basically tap back those messages uh, through kinetic energy uh, back to the spectator. Uh, additionally, what it's also doing at that point is um, there are motion sensors around the installation in which basically as you're speaking or as multiple people are in the space, it can pick up where people are uh, and actually tap back through uh, the solenoids to the, each person. Uh, so, um, and here's kind of an example of uh, kind of an early point in so the uh, uh, development of it. Territory. So I basically used a lot of different audiobooks as both ways to train the speech to text model, but also as ways to basically see if it was actually working properly in the in in the speech to text uh, translation there. Uh, but you know, some of the really kind of more interesting things that happened within that, which is would be the kind of like glitch and error within the machine. Uh, because you also had multiple different solenoids and electronics within this metal, basically, cage. Uh, you also had auditory and other types of RF interference within the environment. So you had these kind of unpredictable interpretations of what people were saying. Um, so on top of that, it would also collect, reinterpret, and then transmit the information to basically a receiver machine. Uh, and that receiver machine, um, just dubbed machine number two, uh, nothing fancy there, but uh, would basically then reinterpret that Morse code uh, over RF within light frequencies. Um, and so, you know, here are a couple of pictures from ALB uh, that basically it will, uh, can be put in a different part of the gallery or a different space and also reinterpret what people are saying in other areas within the space. Uh, so just as a quick example of this, uh, this is actually the night before uh, we sent these to ALB and- uh, Our batch of data seemed to contradict the scene, but it turned out that the engineer, engineers had no framework for understanding the other process. So for those of you that can't actually uh, visit the gallery. That's essentially the type of interaction that you would see. Uh, you can see me in the the reflection of probe of machine one, actually moving around uh, and seeing that. But really, it's looking at the idea of the artificial intelligence, both as a memory archive for dynamic storage of complex kind of human culture, human language, and things like that, but also as an interpretation of decay and reinvention, reinvent, reinvention of that culture through uh, how a machine would see it. So um, this is an ongoing project. Uh, so every about two years, I've, I'm working on a new probe in the series. So probe series three, which is currently under development, really investigates how, again, an exoplanetary machine that would come to our solar system would sense light and color uh, within this kind of idea of 
how could color and light basically create a language within that kind of a three dimensional space. So, uh, and the last one here is a really nice shot of ELB with a uh, probe machine too. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for this uh, very nice uh, presentation about your work and connection with the probe one and probe two. And before I move to the next panelist, uh, I would like to remind that we are collecting questions uh, for the Q&A session uh, through our uh, live stream uh, YouTube chat. Our second panelist is Gene Kogan. He is an artist and a programmer who is interested in autonomous systems, collective intelligence, generative art, and computer science. He's a, a collaborator with the num numerous open source software projects and gives workshops and lectures on topics at the intersection of code and art. Gene initiated ML4A, a, a free book for machine learning for creative practice, and regularly, regularly publishes video lectures, writings, and tutorials to facilitate a greater public understanding of the subject. The screen is yours, Gene. Uh, okay, so yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Gene Kogan, and uh, we're going to tell you about Abraham. Basically, Abraham is a project about uh, creating art through collective intelligence, uh, through uh, basically getting people together uh, to to kind of pull their creativity to to make something really interesting. And it's kind of a combination of of AI and uh, human intelligence. So we're going to get into it. Um, so uh, just a quick introduction. I don't know why this should be here, but when I was a kid, I used to uh, play like AI, you know, video games. Like uh, my favorite was playing hockey. But um, unlike most other kids, I would I would sort of let the AIs play against each other and just watch them. And so this might explain a lot about about me and about this project uh, as we as we get into it. Uh, I've always been really interested in 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 AI and uh, you know how to do things kind of creatively with it watching you know watching them simulate and, and sort of create life and lifelike forms and so on uh, so I've been working in AI art for for a long time now uh, this is a, a again trained on many paintings and you can see that AIs are capable of of producing really realistic and vivid sort of imagery so yeah this is a, another these are all GANs. You've probably seen lots of these over over the last few years, and uh, yeah, well, let's just kind of keep getting into it. Uh, so let me let me skip some slides real quick. This is actually some other uh, AI art stuff that I've done before. This is actually a, a DC GAN from 2015, just just showing you the the possibilities of of sort of AI generated art. Uh, this is also AI generated art using different techniques like Deep Dream and uh, style transfer. These are some works that basically imitate the styles of, of different artists and different painters uh, from, from different times. So uh, lately I've been working on text to image stuff. So in, over the last year or so, it's become possible to generate really interesting looking images uh, from text inputs, uh, directly from text inputs. So like this is a banana performing stand-up comedy. So I'll show you maybe some more examples of it. So like, uh, let's see. A dinosaur in the rainforest. A cityscape made out of flowers. The vastness of outer space. A cart full of flowers. So all of these are generated entirely from text inputs. And this is kind of the, the genesis of the Abraham project. And I'm going to show you some, some uh, screenshots from, from there. So, uh, so here's some, for example, this is just made from the last few minutes by different people using it. Destiny arrives all the same. Quack, quack. 
Do good. Magical castle night. Ancient Indian kingdom. Face of the digital renaissance. So, so it's become possible to generate images with uh, basically like a natural language interface, uh, making these you know, really, really interactive and dynamic uh, in correspondence with, with uh, different people. A drawing in the style of MC Escher, so you can make videos as well. So for a long time, uh, different artists have obsessed over, you know, making making agents that produce artworks that have some notion of autonomy or life to them, agency, kind of will. And uh, Harold Cohen, in particular, kind of started the Aaron project from maybe I think in the nineteen nineties, eighties, and made a lot of progress. He even gave Aaron a name, uh, Aaron, and. Uh, worked on it basically for the rest of his life. But, uh, but all of these, uh, you know, artificial artists that, that we've created over time, they sort of have this, uh, limit, they have limitations that they sort of don't uh, necessarily, uh, well, they don't, they don't necessarily feel independent. They sort of lack agency, but, but there's a, there's this history of AI art an artificial life um, from the 1990s, uh, you know, simulation uh, games, electric sheep. Basically, these are all examples of projects where either uh, there was a notion of, of trying to re recreate life using AI or to simulate it. Uh, or uh, in this case, electric sheep is a little different because it's not necessarily an artificial life project, but it's it's basically a collective intelligence project where uh, this this project is by uh, Scott Draves. Uh, basically, this project where the collective computing of a whole network of people is producing this screensaver. Uh, yeah, simulation also falls in this category. So, so all of these things they have these limitations where the uh, the the. Well, the, the, the program is sort of written by a single artist and then the AI, you know, so to speak, is, is kind of uh, just acting out the creativity of the artist. So, uh, you know, we think of this as like AI as a tool for an artist. Uh, and so maybe, you know, one analogy I have in my head is that the artist is like the ventriloquist and the AI is like the dummy. It doesn't have its own sort of life or its own soul. Yeah, basically, so the question I'm trying to ask is, you know, can we give the, can we make the artist autonomous? Can we make the artist have its own voice? And so my idea is to kind of like, well, so so I was kind of inspired by this concept of an art DAO. And an art DAO uh, is a concept that emerged from kind of early, early thinking in, in the blockchain space about uh, decentralized autonomous organizations. And uh, the idea, this idea by Trent McConaughey and Simon de la Rubier basically said, okay, what if we make a program, put it on, uh, make a program that runs, you know, basically uh, uh, immutably, unstoppably, autonomously, that makes generative art and puts it on the blockchain and, uh, you know, it either notarizes it or, it, you know, using something like a scribe or basically today this would be an NFT and then um, use, uses the proceeds for that to pay for its own computation and to pay for its own development. And so this was kind of the art DAO concept. And this fascinated me because it felt like it was introducing the, the um, well, the missing key, uh, which was autonomy. I think in, in the missing the missing piece in most of the AI art projects that I had been, you know, following up to that time, and uh, there's been lots of interesting projects of generative art on chain, uh, but all of them sort of lack this property of 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 originality. So like you know things like, um, well, uh, uh, autoglyphs for example, generative. All of these they they put shapes on uh, on 
you know, into the artwork and this and, and they're totally immutable, but they they uh, they aren't uh, well they they're not original because they're they're still created by a single programmer. And so the artist is sort of plagiarizing their their author, I would say. And so Abraham is kind of basically an attempt to to um, to to uh, try to solve these in collectively in one project. Basically, the the idea here is that I want to um, you know explore this notion of artificial life and uh, you know and and basically explore the use of collective intelligence and artificial intelligence in, in synchronicity in some sense to create unique and original works of art. And, um, and then there's some more practical reasons. There's, there's interesting technologies that we're exploring in this project that have lots of very general, uh, you know, general purposes and general uh, applications uh, in security, privacy, decentralization. And there's also some economic models embedded into this project, which I'm exploring. So let me keep going here. Uh, the the basic premise is is using a uh, a trying to basically gather the collective intelligence of a network of people who are collaborating to uh, basically give this artist their personality um, through some kind of a crowdsourced mechanism. So the the idea here is that the the artist you know gets its personality from everybody collectively and so nobody controls it you know it's decentralized nobody can imprint their own personality into the artist it really should sort of uh reflect the the crowd and so this is kind of um this has been what's obsessing me for for the last couple of years it's inspired this this idea is inspired by um you know, I, I kind of lean on on uh, certain cultural metaphors that we have uh, for collective intelligence. The, the this notion of superorganisms, where the uh, collective has its own agency. That could the, the hive mind. You know, the hive mind is like a a uh, an intelligence which is separate from each of the individual components. And so, this is kind of like what what Abraham is all about. Um, the uh, Abraham, the more technically, like what I'm trying to do is take a machine learning model, like one of those GANs that I showed you earlier, and then basically decentralize its execution so that the, you know, if it's a neural network, the neural network can be uh, operated only through a, um, a decentralized group of, of, of actors who uh, control operation to that, to that model. Uh, either through something like a secure multi-party computation grid, which is what this is, or uh, by some other means. And so this would achieve the the sort of you know decentralization aspect. It's very experimental. It's, it's very difficult to do machine learning decentralized. It's just not efficient. Uh, but there's lots of interest in decentralized machine learning for the purposes of of trying to um, well for for sort of ancillary reasons like for advancing security and privacy. Uh, but it has this other, this other application, which which I'm which I'm most interested in, and I think that that something like this it it can be said to model the collective imagination, uh, you know, because we're sort of imagining when we when we, you know, make artworks, we are, we're we're using our imagination. We kind of pull things from our from our really deep and, and imagine things, and then try to try to bring them out, and then this is the. You know, to the extent that we're, that machine learning reflects a training set that's made out of millions of contributors, then I think there's something very, very sort of deep and collective about that, and that's kind of what I'm, you know, what what I'm going for with Abraham. Uh yeah, that that's that's really all I wanted to say. So thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Super. I think we will have a lot to discuss towards the end of our discussion. Uh, but before we jump into our discussion, I'd like to um, introduce Alexander Koenig, um, who is uh, a media theoretician, researcher, and audiovisual artist living in Berlin. He works as a freelancer in the fields of real-time animation, critical engineering, and digital video. 
He got his Doctor of Philosophy degree from the University of Fine Arts Vienna. And Alexander Koenig was also teaching semiotics and media theory at the Metz Academy Stuttgart for several years and is now giving lectures on machine learning at Bauhaus University Weimar. His interest in the intersection between science, technology, and art led him to work with artists like Constanze Rum and Emilia Skarnutje um, oh. by providing uh, VR animations and digital simulations for experimental movies and installations uh, shown at festivals like Berlinale. He is also deeply rooted in electronic sculpture and producing electronic music for over 20 years. So screen is yours, Alexander. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for inviting me. I hope you can see and hear me. I want to introduce uh, my short talk with a quote by Marx. Um, to quite read, uh, but only since the introduction of machinery has the workman fought against the instrument of labor itself, the material embodiment of capital. He revolts against the particular form of the means of production as being the material basis of the capitalist mode of production. It took both time and experience before the work people learned to distinguish between machinery and its employment by capital and to direct their attacks not against the material instruments of production, but against the mode in which they are used. And I think uh, this quote of Marx is uh, quite actual. So my whole talk is about uh, uh, is about machine learning, obviously, but uh, it's uh, it, it's basically that what I what, what I want to say is that um, it's not against uh, not against the technology itself. I think the the problem of the whole uh, idea of machine learning is um, the digital capitalism behind it. So uh, I want to give a brief uh, information about the whole structure, uh, especially about the organization of knowledge first. So when we, when we uh, look at the organization of knowledge in machine learning, we first see that uh, we have uh, the frameworks like uh, TensorFlow, uh, which is done by, by Google, um, that uh, developed by uh, big institutions like uh, Google and Facebook and so on. And this kind of knowledge is completely restricted by these institutions. So you cannot access uh, the really deep structures of this kind of frameworks and so on. And also uh, the, the papers published on, on the topic of machine learning are really uh, uh, in, in some kind of industrial level of research. So it's really hard for, um, artists or independent researchers to access that kind of, of level, not just because uh, you, you lack the, the information itself, but you also need the organizations of knowledge and the means of production and industrial organization of uh, programming and so on. So what we uh, can access is the, um, the actual papers and so on. But when you look into these papers, it's the form of knowledge they publish. They're just uh, basically mathematical formulas. So uh, there's no uh, programs that are, that are released by them. So at, at the level of for what you can achieve with advanced knowledge, you can actually uh, get into uh, this uh, certain, into certain frameworks and you can uh, go into applications of uh, released code. So that's the, the uh, stuff gene also used so that's uh, scripts you can use um, and uh, that's open for for the public but um, even uh, the building and the architecture of the systems is done by by big institutions and uh, it's it's quite uh, I, I talk also as an artist or as a teacher and I have to uh, always uh, teach the students not to get into hybrids and tell okay I programmed an artificial intelligence system uh, because that's basically impossible for a single individual. So um, the next thing is when you when you look into these papers and the whole organization structure of knowledge, uh, you see uh, there is there that there is no kind of um, uh, knowledge uh, structure that's based on on some kind of a uh, function. So or uh, uh, a real theory. So there was also a talk about the. Uh, um, the, the, the loss of theory at, at, at the end. So what they do um, is 
uh, they compare, uh, so they build machines, uh, throw data on it, and then they compare the outcome of the, this, uh, the, the machines uh, and um, uh, yeah, try to compare the results. So there's no, uh, be, uh, no theory behind, for example, it's a good uh, quote by Yelinet, Yelinet of IBM, which shows there is no kind of uh, semiotics behind all of this machine learning, uh, speech recognition software. So, so it's based, it's just statistical. There's no idea of language itself. Also in art, it's just statistical. So there's, there's no idea of art. There's no kind of, also no, no idea of art behind it, how it can function or so on. So it's just uh, mechanical statistics that are then compared. And uh, so the, be and the best system is basically then that, that's uh, released. So. Um, so the next thing I want, I want to explain a bit, uh, so to, to frame machine learning in, in another way, so we were now into the knowledge structure, so that's the actually the structure how machine learning is uh, applied in the means of production, um, and maybe you heard, so where was it, uh, sorry, so, yeah. Um, sounds a bit like buzzword bingo, but uh, that's, uh, that's actually what I want to talk now about. So it's edge computing, cloud computing, machine learning, and the Internet of Things. Uh, so all are part of the digital capitalism. I think that's, that's not uh, about the buzzwords that unite it, but it's uh, the digital form of uh, uh, digital capitalism and the production methods of modern software development. So uh, the graphics I use now are uh, directly from NVIDIA famous software and hardware company now. And so uh, you see on the left, it's edge computing and, and uh, applications. So it's safety, retail, construction, manufacturing. Uh, then you have uh, on-premise service and then uh, the cloud service and then uh, visualization and uh, basically the whole um, uh, display uh, of, of, the, of the data. So, and I think what's, what's really happening now uh, what's quite important, I want to show you this small device here. That's an edge device, also developed by NVIDIA. And so uh, on these small devices are uh, uh, neural networks that are um, able to classify all kinds of visual data in real time. That means uh, this data is, is processed directly on these on this chips and it's just the classification streams are sent to uh, the servers uh, that saves a lot of bandwidth, which is money. And also uh, it's really highly scalable. So, and it's, I don't talk about the future, it's, it's, it's really, really, really happening now. And so what you, what you see or what you might, might sense, so, that, uh, so the neural networks on these devices, they're not central. So there's no central steering AI on, on servers or on cloud systems. The really interesting thing is, that uh, the artificial intelligence is happening on the edge devices. It's on the periphery. It's not, it's not central. It's uh, a, specialized, uh, a specialized network on, on super small devices. So, uh, but what, what was happening in the last couple of years, you might, you might have heard about Kubernetes. That's a highly developed cluster system introduced by Google. And I think the history of, of the introduction is also tried, or says, says a lot about the knowledge structure and the monopoly of knowledge in, in our, uh, in our uh, actual days. So uh, Google developed a system called Borg, uh, I think since 2004. So, and they used it for over 10 years uh, secretly. So no one in, uh, really knew about it. And uh, it's a highly uh, developed, well, very abstract language where you can basically uh, run servers and uh, construct server structures uh, in, in a really unbelievable large scale. So what they, what they did, they abstracted uh, hardware on a, on a, in, a, in a level of programming language. Um, and uh, I think yeah, seven years ago, they released it as an open source uh, code that was called Kubernetes and it completely revolutionized uh, completed the IT industry. So you can run, so you can run your cloud service over a programming language basically. So you don't need to go into Linux or virtualization of machine. It's complete abstract level of language. And so 
the whole machine learning uh, uh, idea of what's what's happening on all development processes make just sense when you uh, combine it with this Kubernetes clusters. So uh, you can train machine learning systems in, in these clusters and deploy them on the small platforms. So I show here. Um, maybe, uh, sorry. So here, um, you see that's an uh, example for architecture. So it's quite uh, technical, but I try to explain it a bit. So on the left, you see cameras and they directly um, send the streams to this uh, uh, Jetson module. So they're, they're analyzing that. And then uh, the streams are sent uh, to AWS clouds uh, run by Amazon. Uh, same uh, applies for, for, for Google. And what they develop now is uh, a system of apps and browser interfaces but you do not even need to program uh, your, your uh, systems anymore. It's like a really slick software interface and so on. And the next phase, what's, what's quite interesting is, is the training. So the training process is quite expensive, uh, in, in, also in costs and in, in labor. So you need uh, lots of data, obviously, uh, big, uh, big data resources. Um, and so-called data analysts, which are basically statisticians uh, that are um, yeah, uh, changing the data in, into certain forms. And then you need a really a hardwired labor, uh, labor in, a, in, a, in a really simple lowest form. So basically people are just like cropping pictures and so on. So and to build these data sets is super, super expensive and also totally out of reach for any normal person. So, and the training of these data sets happens then on, uh, also on NVIDIA cards normally, but these cards are not uh, the, the cheap ones, like on the edge computers, they're super expensive. So we talk about whatever, 15,000 euros upwards, and it takes a couple of days to train these systems. And then you can, after training, you can deploy them directly in a production circle onto these little devices. And uh, so you can build your drone systems, your surveillance camera systems and so on. And I think it's quite obvious that this uh, getting more and more uh, dangerous because of the monopoly situation, not just of the knowledge, but also of the production values. And uh, yeah, the, the total monopoly structure also of this cloud architecture. Um, so maybe you heard about this Gaia project in Europe that's happening, uh, that's taking place now. They try to develop their own cloud system, but they're years behind uh, Google and AWS. And when you compare, uh, so I, I, I try to compare the, the cloud providers in, in, in Germany, for example, Hetzner to, to Google. And so, and it's not just like, it's, 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 it's a, a bit forward. It's like alien technology. So you can easily set up a, a network or a whole cloud system for a company or a scientific computing facility on, on a browser. And uh, yeah, I think it's quite, it's quite, quite a problem. So, and I wanna close my talk with a quote by uh, Simon Daw. Uh, now in order that the human function be meaningful, it's absolutely necessary that each man employed at a technical task should acquaint himself with every conceivable aspect of the machine, should arrive at some sort of understanding of it, and should pay attention as much to its elements as to its integration into the functional ensemble. The technical object must be known in itself for the relationship between man and machine is to be steady and valid, hence the need of a technical culture. So I, that's my final uh, <laughs> quote. And I think it links uh, back uh, to, to Marx. And so my plan here would, would be at, at the end to um, have uh, a conversation uh, between, between the faculties and uh, different kinds of knowledge ideas, um, but with some kind of understand. Uh, uh, so you need some kind of deep understanding of uh, of how these uh, things work. So you need to be able to understand the programming, but also I think it's mandatory that the people in charge uh, in technology 
need to uh, learn uh, politics and ethics because I think it's uh, completely mental to think you can implant uh, something like ethics or moral or any kind of jurisdiction in, in machine code. That's just not, uh, not possible. And uh, so, yeah, that would be my idea, yeah. Thank you so much, Alexander. That was a very inspiring uh, closing, uh, giving a hint uh, about the ethics and the moral side of uh, technological development, not only about AI and machine learning, but it's actually can be implemented in any kind of rapid development in the technology. But at the same time, this is what we are living in, uh, a rapid advancement in the AI technology. And then we sometimes miss the ethics and moral side, which connects very well uh, with Katar Spiel's uh, talk, uh, which I would like to introduce them very shortly. Uh, Katar Spiel researches marginalized perspectives on technology to inform critical design and engineering. Their work is situated at the intersection of computer science, design, and cultural studies. Drawing on methods from critical participatory design and action research, as well as theories from disability studies and queer theory, they collaborate with neurodivergent and or non-binary non folks in conducting explorations of novel potentials for designs, methodological contribu uh, contributions to human-computer interaction, and innovative technological artifacts. The screen is yours, Kata. Thank you so much for that introduction um there we go i think i share the right thing <laughs> um all right yeah hello and thank you all for having these conversations like directly connecting to the last thing i do teach critical theory and ethics and design to computer science students so we're gonna have <laughs> lots of um uh, things to talk about there uh it's very interesting but today I will talk about adversarial examples, and largely about how I end up being one too many technical systems without intending to. I should also note that my current work is conducted as part of the project entitled Exceptional Norms, Marginalized Bodies in Interaction Design, and has been supported by the Austrian Science Fund, Fund the FWF, under the project number T1146G. Usually I'm not that dry, the rest will be fine, uh, more um, engaging. All right. <laughs> Um, I'm going to start with just briefly defining what I mean by a technological infrastructure um, and how I generally understand the notions of digital mechanism, which I generally understand as um, kind of like digital mechanisms and tools governing access to resources along the options they offer. Though particularly, I'm looking basically at databases and their human and non-human interfaces, uh, interfaces um, so for example, web forms. We first have to understand a bit of a, uh, that databases can provide a form of text, and this is how I kind of like deal with it. So the way databases articulate gender is subtle, but constantly present. Uh, predominantly gender is then encoded as a data type of a Boolean, that is what most often happens, a purely binary representation of gender, either one or zero, on or off. You have a gender or you don't. It's not that easy. Um, even within seemingly progressive systems allowing people to self-identify along an extensive range of categories or maybe even through an open text field, um, non-binary individuals might still be inauthentically represented in a reductionist binary to advertisers to maximize profit along gendered assumptions, which is what Facebook does basically, um, for example. So it's not, um, it's not that, uh, that even if we can, on the interface level, define ourselves, then that often means that it doesn't necessarily happen on the back end. And yeah, to that, a few additional words about me um, so that it is a bit more clear why I find that problematic. My pronouns in English are they, them, I am Kata. For other languages, just please ask. Um, and as you might have guessed, I am non-binary, and I did kind of always know about that, but I didn't have the vocabulary for the longest time, so I only came out in these terms about six or seven years ago. And I'm also inter, and please, this is a disclaimer, keep in mind that not every inter person is non-binary or vice versa, the two just coincide in my person. And you should not assume anything about someone's identity without them telling you anyway. 
So I am non-binary and inter, and since I also hold a German passport, I have the incredible privilege of gaining a legal gender status outside of the traditional binary. Um, I remember that when I publicly posted my corrected gender entry, a friend commented on social media, oh, I'm so glad that this is over for you now. And I remember thinking uh, over, I think it only just started. So you see, I suddenly found myself in a situation where I was challenging many societal systems built on gender binaries without me intending to. I was looking for recognition and for being myself. And suddenly I found myself in the position of being treated like an adversarial example, like it's as if I were even deliberately working against everyone else. So I looked at how this is kind of like happening in technology and I've been doing an autoethnographic study, which I sometimes still um, continue to add on to, but I have started since August, 2019. So when my gender legally changed. Um, and the purpose was kind of like to look at uh, whether there is an increasing awareness, um, look at these non-routine routine engagements that uh, marginalized people have with in digital infrastructures. And I chose the topic of gender in web forms and subsequent databases as this was a unique opportunity to investigate myself, augmented by my lived experiences with the potential to garner insights into the implications of such digital infrastructures for marginalized people. The other thing is, I wouldn't want to do this to anyone else. So I recorded any interaction with gendered web forms asking for gender directly or gender titles um, that would not allow me to register my correct legal gender with the intent to conduct this research maybe for a year. <laughs> Usually this involved in a screenshot of the situation like this one. Um, yeah which is, by the way, very German, um, because it says uh, it, it gives you uh, academic titles, but it like uh, has a gender marker behind them. Um, so I did record these, and then I kind of uh, forced myself every time to also have a brief personal note in every entry um, uh, and on all the notes to trace my emotional development and the status of my feelings. So yeah, me challenging these infrastructures, I thought, was kind of like a thing I could do because, I mean, this was then my job and not just like, you know, how it is for many non-binary people uh, and trans people and inter people, how they just have to engage with that less systematically, but um, on a daily basis without getting any recognition for this. This is my privilege, which is why I talk about this now. And as I start, said, started in 2019 and earlier on, it was pretty systematic. You see, there are lots of cases and I'm kind of like writing it all down. Um, and then there were these phases already starting when I just couldn't bear to willingly and explicitly expose myself to the continuous and sustained notions of negotiating my personhood, when anyone's personhood should not be the subject of negotiation in any case. But of course, it also got worse when COVID affected my personal life more vividly, which is why the following months, so after the lockdown was in Austria, I only recorded instances or at least started the interaction with an entity in rare cases. Um, although I suddenly had to deal with more gendered in infrastructures because this is how you got your things. And so what I have uh, um, from this description is a set of 55 cases that I'm still adding on to. And um, it allows me uh, to understand some of what is happening when non-binary people encounter gendered infrastructure. And most instances across the 55 cases are drawn from private or public commentary context, uh, company context, um, and largely around commerce and transit. And the comparatively high number of universities and with that job applications and academic funding bodies stems from my personal context as an early career academic who was on the job market during that time. And several institutions did, for that matter, not expect gender to be reported either by not asking for this information or making it optional, and those are not recorded. And now, latest, at this point, you might have wondered what this ha all has to do with artificial intelligence. There's nothing artificial about this, or uh, like nothing artificially or otherwise intelligent about this here. And the thing is, where we get our data from <laughs> shapes how we can process it and what inferences we make and what we end up knowing artificially to some extent and how we then shape the lives of everyone. But to put it more bluntly and bring it down to more of the material consequences, 
What this also entails is how I still cannot get some insurance coverage um, because uh, there is no model that exists for non-binary and inter people, not health insurance. I have health insurance. It's great. Um, some jobs were not available to me or only if I misgendered myself or indicated that my gender was another than I held legally, which kind of like is not a great start into an employment context when you have to lie about yourself because the form doesn't allow it otherwise, and they don't give you any chance to send your data otherwise. There's a lot of jobs that I didn't apply to just because of that, um, which in and it of itself is also something that I could afford to do, which you know is not an option for everyone. And then whenever I voted, and I voted twice since then, I received my documents in a gendered way, and I was really worried on whether my no vote would even be legal and counted, and I'm not 100% sure that happened. Um, or that I nearly caused issues for my own institute to get allocated the money they should um, receive from the university because I had to refuse to engage with the publication database because it did not only require me to misgender myself, but also to misgender co-authors. And that public housing in Vienna is only accessible to me if I misgender myself in the system and that in medical contexts, I have to deal with gendered assumptions and rooms, even in cases where the context is entirely different, there are no reference values for blood values for inter people. And that leads also to non-binary and inter people not seeking medical care early enough to avoid negative experiences. You see, artificial intelligence is always acting within a context that is largely informed by how we assume things to be. And for some of us, they aren't. And for those of us where they aren't, it's so exhausting. But you know, all of that happened and people who I interacted with treated the moment I engaged with them more often than not as hostile, which I found curious. So there were 39 cases in which I received a response and sometimes they didn't answer. In addition to how I classified the responses along argument and outcome, I'm going to give you here an example of how more of the kind of like fields that they had. So there were several cases where there was just like open hostility. And I will not go into the de details of some of them because I also have to protect myself from potential retaliations. Um, and another fairly common response is just like plain dismissal, like, um, like I know that EU fund, an EU funding body, I asked to uh, be able to apply for funding and the IT system said, if you are the researcher, you will have to pick one of the two options to be able to submit the proposal, which I find interesting since it follows a notion of dismissing my existence and ignoring that I have a real problem by not being able to provide my legal gender. I cannot stress this enough. Um, though, I mean, and but I should note here that um, whether someone has a passport that reflects their gender identity isn't an of itself a privilege and should not be the only reason why you should offer it. But anyway, it's one of them usually. And I mean, some governmental bodies have continuously ignored my requests as well, despite automated emails promising a response. Um, and yeah, how can I just be so stubborn and exist outside the binary? And I guess that it is better than promising a change such as done by Austrian Airlines in September 2019 by stating we are currently working on changing our interface and failing to uh, implement that for now more than two years. I uh, have also checked to verify. So, you know, in about five cases, uh, one out of five cases, sorry, but 20%, I managed to achieve systemic change such as an academic stakeholder which replied after about a month that we changed our guidelines and forms to now include non-binary people. So that did happen, but only in 20% of the cases. And I cannot stress at what cost that comes. So as I indicated, I also documented feelings and direct emotional responses for these situations and it just has not been good. I had not a great time even before there was a pandemic. Um, I really had, um, mental health issues going on with that because it's really hard to constantly just expose yourself to the potential of being treated like I was in some cases. And those little cases, every time now I see one sign where I can, or a form or like just kind of infrastructure where I cannot do this also reminds me not only of what that means for all of my interactions with that infrastructure, but all the cases where that happens. So it is a trauma response. 
but I cannot do anything about that anymore. Um, I still am proud of that work, that's fine. <laughs> anyway, um, but I want to point out that the sustained negativity of this research project amplified in my life and by my choice to actively engage with the context in which I was not accounted for might also provide an answer to those claiming they never met a non-binary person themselves or that their non-binary friends never complain. And the cost of complaint just tends to be so much larger for us than for those the complaint is directed at. Please read Sarah Ahmed if you want to know more about this. I know I'm a bit over time, <laughs> so I'm just going to wrap this up a little bit quicker than I would otherwise. But essentially, there are some suggestions of how you could treat gender in databases. But what I want us to do is to look at, at margins more productively and um, that we shouldn't just keep on building infrastructures only oriented on majorities that we keep on narrowing because what happens then is that we keep on narrowing our definitions of what it means to be human and cause more and more harm to more and more people. We need to start understanding what we perceive as an adversarial example, not as destructive, but as challenging us to do better as aspects that allow us to figure out what data cannot give us and what automatisms do not give us and where technologies won't save us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kata. This, um, I must say, uh, from my perspective, I think your personal fight uh, inspires and then creates a change for the uh, next generations. So thank you for fighting for your uh, non-binary gender. Um, and then this is important to uh, include the databases of many AI um, and machine learning databases. And I, I mean, I'm coming from a language that doesn't have gender. And uh, it was so cliche years ago when people were just putting on these images on my Facebook, uh, showing how a language is gendered when you are using Google Translate. Because when you put like a, this is a, this is a doctor, I'm just using this on purpose. Uh, because actually uh, when you put it, it, it is a doctor in Turkish, but it's always translate, uh, he is a doctor in English. But when you put it, it is a nurse in Turkish, it translates, she is a nurse. So this is, uh, this is so implemented already in the uh, machine learning or Google's database uh, early 2000s. And then this was a meme in the beginning of the Facebook when it was available in 2008, nine uh, in outside the US. So that's why I find it really interesting to just uh, discuss this uh, um, transformational possibility of having more genders in the language, which will impact on databases for the machine learning and AI. Um, Should for mention. this like a very gender uh, oriented uh, starting point to our discussions, but um, to, rep uh, to just like a rewind also, just uh, give a little uh, credit to Alexander's uh, critical position from a very Marxist perspective to discuss this like an infrastructures and then a capitalist system and in its connection to Google, which also part of what Jean was working on because eventually this is a certain databases, I guess, is uh, influential for your work, right, Jean? And it's just uh, because when you have this like a AI uh, for a machine learning for artist workshop in Berlin in the beginning of the exhibition under the wild shadow, you were also using uh, certain open source uh, platforms that Google created because this was what we have access. Can you maybe give a little bit information about your workshop and then just uh, connect um, with your practice? Um, yeah, we we had the the workshop that we did for for the. Um, well, it was basically a workshop on, on how Abraham works and Abraham is using all open source technology um, built on sort of deep learning libraries and models that have been trained on very large data sets uh, to generate, you know, interesting looking images. Um, I, um, yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's all open source. So it's kind of this big collective wellspring of contributions. It's very hard to, hard to really you know, uh, well, 
the output is is a product of many many uh, contributions, right? From the from the software that was made by you know researchers, engineers, and so on, to the data sets that that influence the the um, the outputs. Those you know data sets are collected from um, many many people, so it's this big sort of yeah, this is really big collective process. Um, very quick uh, follow up, but the uh, database that you are mentioning, Gene, are you also using your own data set to feed Abraham? Uh, I never asked this before. I just realized it's an also interesting concept to feed with a certain image uh, set data set. Uh, no, no, Abraham. So, well, right, Abraham, the scope of Abraham is a little bit bigger than the than the one generator that you saw. Uh, but the current generator on, on Abraham, that's using uh, two models that were uh, produced at, in different places by different people. On uh, Those models are very difficult to uh, replicate there. Uh, you know, the amount of compute required is um, you would need millions of dollars to uh, to to make it, and so they they're released open source in there, and they're you know allowed for uh, this kind of usage. So um, so yeah, and then there's there's some code that basically combines the two models that lots of amateurs have been kind of um, you know sharing online and and kind of you know making a workflow based on that, and, and I'm part of this community that's doing that. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, before I would like to continue asking a question to Benjamin, but I also want to uh, bring Alexander's perspective about the um, this edge uh, system that you mentioned, that one can actually create their own uh, devices. Um, in I, I find it also interesting when we're listening Gene's uh, Abraham project and your uh, project that you are discussing to create one's own uh, cloud systems and an edge systems. And uh, so this is also decentralization of the whole capitalist system in a way, but how it is easy for individuals to just really create this uh, infrastructures. Are you talking to me? You asked me? Ah. Um. Yeah, it's basically impossible. I mean, you, you can you can use the small devices. So we use it in, in our in our course and seminars. And um, I think for students or artists, it's quite um, uh, important to get into that. So it's, it's a development kit and so, so you can get into it, so you can understand it. But um, it's at the end, uh, it's a production pipeline in industrial scale. So what's actually, um, what I actually showed is a pipeline for um, development operations on a, on a scale of, of Google and so on. And uh, yeah, the outman even also the, the knowledge structure that you can access. So it's not, it's not really available, but I think you can somehow try to access it and understand it. And I think that's, that's a good way also to criticize it. Um, but it's not really possible to recreate also what Gene said. Um, you, you cannot uh, build this, uh, you cannot train your own network. It's, it's, it's impossible. So you need uh, engineers, you need the data, you need a lot of money, you need computing power. And uh, so it's, it's basically out of hands. So it's, it's the old, again, or the old capitalistic or the old Marxist idea of the means of production. And I, I think there was a time in, com in computing where you had access to the means of production. So you just needed a computer and you can, could code. But uh, we, we are leaving that, that, that level. And um, it's not just like you, you don't have access it uh, and you cannot understand it. So the, the knowledge is not available to a normal person. So no one is actually knowing what Google uh, as available on technology or whatever. So no one knows how it works. So that's a big problem, I think. So it, it's a monopoly of knowledge. Um, I would like to ask a question to ben Benjamin, um, because when we were actually looking at Abraham uh, project, uh, there are certain databases that are part of the project. Whereas in probe one and probe two, you are creating your own data sets, correct? I mean, is it actually, it's just the, the data is collected real time in the exhibition space. 
uh, and then it creates a in probe one it is uh, collecting the uh, presence of the audience and probe two it is still motion and uh, audio um, so then this is actually a different way of uh, creating a machine learning system in a way in, as in, uh, in contrast to this, like a capitalist system that Alexander uh, is criticizing. Or maybe I'm well, totally I mean, interpreting it. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think, I think, you know, with, with my works, it's much more about the, the idea and the context of how, how would I say? Sorry, it's it's midnight here, and I'm pretty tired. Uh, so it, 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 you know, it, it's 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 much more of it's not just about the AI. It's about the larger concept, right? And AI is just one of the tools and methods that we can use to create these, uh, you know, any kind of application, right? So you know, machine learning, at least at the level that we have, right? Weak weak AI, right? Um, or, or weak machine learning, right? Um, you know, is only good for basically whatever we tell it. And it's usually good for one process. If that's, you know, manipulating an image or creating an image, if that's, uh, you know, natural language processing of like speech to text for a specific language, uh, you know, so like when you're thinking about probe one or probe two, sorry, um, you know, when I worked on that piece in particular, there is three different models used. One, one for Chinese, one for English, one for German. Uh, the, the probe that was sent over to uh, Germany actually only does English, uh, partially because there's not enough data. Baidu had worked on a model for text to, or speech to text. Um, and there's some open source models out there that are just really not good at all. Uh, the, the German ones that I could find that were open source, since I don't speak German in any uh, uh, more than your basic, uh, uh, you know, uh, tourist uh, language, you know, th there's not much out there. Uh, I took uh, some of the deep speech uh, models for English. Uh, that's about 50,000 texts uh, and utilize that as the base for, uh, 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 for uh, probe two. Probe one utilizes uh, a couple of different image databases for image tracking, for basically object tracking, uh, age, different things like that. Um, you know, I, I personally don't have the bandwidth or com compute power to create my own large scale models. And, and, you know, Alexander talked to quite a bit about this, you know, you know to really be able to, and even Gene talked about this, to really be able to, <coughs> you know, uh, uh, create a model that is, um, uh, you know, it, take, it takes quite a lot of compute power. So, but, you know, part of the, part of the, the view that I also have is, you know, if, if you're opening up a app on your phone, if you're looking, using an app on Google or whatever, there it's, it's, you know, the machine learning model that it's referencing is just part of the larger application, right? So within the probes, uh, when you talk about the motion sensing or other types of, uh, you know, uh, uh, interactions that are happening there, those are all separate programs talking to each other, right? So, um, you know, or if it's the RF network or different things like that. So it's just one small component within the larger installations. Um, Chris has a question that I would like to address to you all. Uh, what will be a to some degree successful activism to create changes in the machine learning system? For instance, if a mass movement refuses to insert their gender into a binary option. Who would like to start first? May I say something quick? Um, uh, I think it's uh, so. I think it's it's uh, the the wrong idea. I think you cannot change the system by changing technology. You know, it's it's just the it just shows the flaw of the system. And uh, of course, you can change 
change the technology and so on. But I think it's, it's still a very neoliberal way of approaching things. And I think it's uh, how they how they uh, uh, treating things right now. It's just like basically like a PR campaign or they seem like a rebranding, but you cannot just like uh, uh, rebrand uh, something without uh, changing the whole underlying problematics. So my nothing, yeah. In my point. Yeah, I, if I may, please. I would add to that. I'm not even behind, like I'm not even for visibility, right? Um, I think visibility in these systems is actually sometimes a trap. So, or like more likely than not. Um, I like to think about this as a way of like, do we need data in that way? Do we want to even do that in that way? Do we want to make um, car insurances uh, differ along gender? Is this even something that we need to calculate in the way we do? Um, I mean, this also ties, uh, uh, I see the other question already, sorry, but this ties into that, right? What, what is the cost of things and is it worth that? Um, kind of, um, do we even need to consider really big systems that then tell us about things that we might not really, that, that might in the end only amplify or only serve those who already are benefiting from the current status quo. Like, I'm not sure, like it's, it's nice and I love a solidarity movement, but that's not it <laughs> like from that perspective. And, and I think it can also help in terms of making like individual instances kind of um, rethink that. Um, but uh, ultimately, I, I don't think that the, what I would, I would feel a bit like I did not succeed in what I wanted to bring across, which might have happened. <laughs> but like, um, if, if, the, if the logic from there is then ultimately, oh, what we do need is, is like a third market. No, that's not the point. The point is, um, this is a fluid concept that we assume to be stable. And that is what data does in a lot of ways. And maybe that's not what we should build really important decisions on. <laughs> if our lives are more flexible and if our, you know, societies and beings are just like having more variety. Um, if I can interject here really quick, but I think, I mean, I think there's a larger systemic thing that's happening outside of the technology itself, right? So, you know, you know, the technology as Alexander pointed out, you know, if you're using TensorFlow, which is at least in probe number two, I'm using Deep Speech, which is, you know, uh, produced uh, the, the program, the, the framework is part of TensorFlow, right? Um, you know, the, there is a very consumer view of that, right? So where are they taking or what data did they use to create at least the English model, right? It was like 50,000 books and most of it was like King James Bible and a bunch of English, very, you know, kind of mainstream, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to classify it here, right? If you're creating a, 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 you know, it's not necessarily the programming of the neural network format, but it's what you're putting into it, right? It's the same thing when you look at facial recognition and uh, some of these companies in the United States that you know you know bias black people versus or minority people versus uh you know white people because they're pulling the data the images from police databases of previous years right so there it, it's not always necessarily the technology or the neural network framework but it's where where are you mining that data from and you know and if that data is depending on who's creating or who's creating that data, that data profile, right? You know, if it's based for consumerism, they're gonna want the two or three largest consumer markets. If that's not going to uh, uh, include, you know, non-binary gender because it's a small minority of the consumer base, well, then that's what it's going to contain, right? You know, so I think, you know, some of it is the technology, but a lot of it is just who is basically pulling in this data because we need large amounts of that data to basically 
teach whatever that one purpose AI, one purpose machine learning model to do, right? So if it's coming from police databases of, of faces, well, you know, there's an issue right there, right? Uh, so, you, you know, I, th I think we need to dig deeper beyond just saying, oh, it's the technology that's wrong. It's who's providing the data for those machine learning models. Uh, Kato, you want to tell yeah. um, Just briefly, there is there is this thing of a thing about data and and kind of like also how you elaborated with the language. Um, and, and I think language is such a good example just because you can only ever recur on what already happened, no matter how long that distance, like it might be really short, but like only ever what just happened. You cannot actively take part with that approach just on a, on a very high level um, in, in what actually is currently negotiated. And you have that a lot in this language context of non-binary people as well. Um, and I do like, I think that also relates a bit to what Jean said about like, you know, what is the generative aspect of this? The other thing is, I'm not sure we can take the technology completely out. I, I agree that it's also like who, where's the data come from? What, who is that collective? What kind of biases play into that? But I think inherent in those technologies, even if they're not working directly probabilistic is a kind of tendency to shape towards what happens more what is more likely to be. And that leaves those who are in like these unlikely margins out. And it will like just mathematically to some extent not be great for people who fall out of those aspects. Jean, would you like to add something? Oh, uh, sorry. Alexander, you also want to add something, but maybe we give the floor first to Jean and then I'll go back to you. I, I don't have necessarily much to add. I would just say maybe back to the original question that that like my interest in this area is kind of more about like uh, economics because a lot of a lot of the problems that we see in um, machine learning is is kind of um, externalities from the predominant business model around machine learning, where which is sort of the is a microcosm of the the business model of the internet where the uh, users of the internet are basically the are the product rather than the consumers and so machine learning models are 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 the purpose of most machine learning models is 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 kind of to um well they're not necessarily aligned with the interests of the users of the machine learning models and so like the solution to that is is a user-owned internet and user owned machine learning models. So group, you know, collect sort of collectively owned machine learning models where, you know, if you if you uh, contributed data or compute or or anything to that process, you should be a collective owner of that uh, of that model. And then uh, to the end, and, and, and you should have governance over that model. And so once you start to have kind of this kind of an economic system, then I think you start to see some of those externalities uh, get much better because then you know the models will be more uh, more representative. Yeah. Alex, Alexander. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think that the biggest problem is that the whole research in machine learning is uh, based on prediction models, and that's what they're built for. So it's it's about prediction and and also how these models uh, or how machine learning is seeing the world is as a principle of vectors. So you need to get everything into a vector representation. And you can imagine it like a cloud, a cloud cluster. And then um, you you somewhere in this in this in this cloud is a point. And when when someone is paying you, then uh, uh, Google tries to bring you from one point to uh, one position to the next position to advertisement, and it works quite well. So it works so well that Google and Facebook own now 80% of the advertisement market in the US. So, you know, that it's, it's, a, it's a certain threat. And I think the next problem is lots of um, computer scientists then refer to the thing, yeah, it's, it, we talk about deep learning, but there's also other kinds of machine learning or, or, or of artificial intelligence. But you, when, when you look at the actually uh, research founding, 
So it, it, it's 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 based on it's totally based on on on, on capital on economy. Even when you go to academia, uh, where you think it might be free, but when you when you look at, at projects like Horizon 2020 uh, and something like that, it's 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 totally uh, for economics and for market solutions. So there is no free research. And even when you when you uh, free or when you see yourself as a computer scientist and when you want to go for free research. Then you end up in academia and uh, you have to uh, do a proposal and then a three year research and then you may get some funding, but uh, with the premise that it's it, it makes uh, some uh, some value, so you cannot uh, research critical and I think that's that's one of the biggest problem that there is no that, and, and all the. All the research that is done, and 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 so is is uh, like Benjamin said, is 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 based on on on, on a, a capital market uh, idea. There's no idea of something uh, in the, uh, individualistic or something like that. So it's it's just not existing. And and I think the best critique is coming now from economists. Uh, uh, you know this article that uh, it was on the front page of the Economist. Which is not exactly left wing paper, but they call for antitrust against Google, and so because uh, so they uh, even the the the, the le least uh, latest neoliberal now realized okay, you have a monopoly which should not yeah, which should not exist in this idea of these people, right? But it's it's obvious, so and uh, yeah, now they they don't know what to do, and you have now digital markets, so they also build their own uh, market ideas, and so I think. It's quite problematic, and I think best that ideas come from from lawyers now and uh, economics. So. Uh, Robertina put a uh, question. Roberta put a question to our chat that I would like to read out loud for the audience. And um, what about the alternative that the controversial paper by Bender and Gebru at all propose? Uh, in addition, the question is bigger, better. And is it possible to create data sets rather than just scape hegemonic data sets? We already started actually discussing it, but I wanted to just uh, open up and then just read out loud. And also we have another comment uh, on our YouTube uh, channel that I would like to read so we can continue talking and discussing. Um, Marvel uh, wrote on our YouTube chat, don't think that the technology changes our life. I was wondering you as artists and educators are pessimistic. Rather, technology is all of us in the society. Of course, we can change the system of technology. Yeah. Um, well, any comments on this? I, I, I'm going to jump in here. It's kind of continuing the conversation, but maybe also answering some of the questions. I'm not pessimistic at all about technology. I think technology. Uh, serves a purpose, and in uh, technology in itself can be both good and bad. Right? It's it's a it, it, you know nuclear you know power can provide power to lots of people and be very green, but it can also create radioactivity. Right? And and if that's let loose, that's let loose. But I think you know one of the things here too that I always consider and, and think about when when thinking about digital technology is it's based in ones and zeros it's based in yes or no's it's based in trues and falses right uh you know we scale that up and we get fairly you know accurate predictive models from it but it's still discrete it's not like us living in real life which i i i, I view at least as a very analog process that's that has the gray areas that that you know there's something to do with when you talk to somebody right you can feel more than just what their face looks like or whatever you see their body language you interact right if i was just going off a predictive model right that's discrete that's basing it on a whole bunch of yes or no's within a within a neural network you know that's not giving me the full picture Right. So, you know, I, I, I think there's limitations to our technology. I think it can do some amazing things for us if that's within the artistic space, if it's within economic space, if it's within modeling climate change or whatever it is. Fantastic. Right. But it's still binary. Right. You know, down to the transistor. 
And I, I think there's something there that we need to think about, which is it, it doesn't deal well with the gray areas or the fuzzy logic that we can as analog beings. And, you know, and, and maybe that's the next jump into quantum computing, maybe. But, you know, and I think uh, the cat's walking behind me. Sorry. Uh, you know, wh whatever it is, but like, you know, you know, we're still dealing with a digital technology at this, at the, at this point that, that again, is only as good as the person that programs the neural network or the group of people and the group of data that's brought in that is basically saying, yes, this is a cat. No, this is not a cat, right? It's still binary at the end. It might be a lot of binary, but it still is a true or false statement in the end, so. Anyone else would like to comment or um, continue? Gene, are you pessimistic? No, uh, no, not at all. Um, I think, you know, technology, I mean, technology is uh, neutral, ultimately, it can be used to, you know, it can be used for good things, can be used for bad things. It's just a matter of, you know, who, who um, takes, you know, takes the courage to aim those things for, you know, the things that they believe in. Um, you know, we have a, I think, you know, we should, we should adopt these technologies, take responsibility over them, and you know, encourage other people to empower themselves with it, with the technologies, and and then I think we'll get better outcomes. Um, yeah, technology is a tool. Alexander, are you pessimistic as an educator? Um, no, not at all. Um, uh, so when so we had pro, uh, projects and seminars uh, for for education when we actually teach. Uh, this the stuff also Gene showed. So, um, and I think it's it's quite. I can give it a, a short example if you like. So, um, so we used this word to vector um, uh, text generation uh, tool, right? So it was all over the news, and it can generate poems and whatever. And so I asked the students uh, uh, just from their common knowledge, uh, what would you like to do? And uh, a woman came up with with the idea to uh, to. Uh, to somehow synthesize all the text, all the, the basically made I uh, made the AI write a new script of Tarantino. So feed all the the neural network with Tarantino scripts, and then uh, the uh, AI should come up with a new script. Uh, and then we went into really programming this this stuff and and teaching uh, how it works and all this vector representations is basically a statistic word count in a very very complex way, and. So then she, she changed the whole uh, uh, subject to the to the idea that she analyzed uh, Twitter uh, Twitter accounts from Obama Trump whatever and analyzed the account of words and uh, nearest neighbors and of occurrence to something like democracy. So you can really use these tools in a certain way to make some kind of um, statement about artistic statement about society or whatever. And I think it's a quite good example. And I, I think it, it, it depends a bit how you use that. So when you know how it works, you can use it in a, in a certain way that makes sense. But when you just uh, go into the thing, okay, I want to write a poem and, and you, you, you play that game, okay, you know, it's, it's, it has some kind of a self and we have a soul and, and so on. When you play that, that game, I think uh, it's, it's leading to nowhere and also uh, giving some kind of the uh, you 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 do all these companies a favor. Uh, it's a, you uh, you su support their PR campaigns at the end. But I think when you when you do it in a in a nice way and when you really understand the tools, then I think it's it's, it's really cool uh, and you can really yeah, do something nice with it. Kata, are you pessimistic? <laughs> I rounds with this pessimism question. <laughs> Oh no, I, I thought about it when, when I listened to the talks and was like, oh wow, this is going like, you know, and I'm going to be the downer. But ultimately, I have to say, so <laughs> um, I have this kind of, I am convinced that when we critique things, we think that they can do better. We think that at the core, they can improve. And at the core, we can have these conversations. And honestly, 
I wouldn't bother with these things, which is also why I'm not going to talk about uh, nuclear, uh, the, the power of nuclear things. I think they're just unilaterally, not discussably bad. Um, but, um, you know, uh, and I, I mean, I do create my own technologies. Like, this is part of my work. I do things and I make arguments with technologies. I use them to build theory. I use speculations. I use design. I use actual things. I um, And, and these also like, you know, right now I'm relying on subtitles uh, uh, for me to comprehend things better. Um, there are, I, I think in the large grand of scale, uh, things, technologies are, you know, starting with reading, writing, there my cultural studies background comes out, but like reading, writing, <laughs> uh, calculating, <laughs> but like in the large thing, we can't say that, but it's definitely what kind of like, in, what, what does it do, right? And when it is based on probabilistic things, when it is based on making predictions from what previously happened and, and kind of like falls into that trap of thinking that that will be like, you know, not more than an informed speculation, ultimately, then there is an issue. And it's never just a technological thing, it's a socio-technical thing. And, you know, under Trump, some technologies were used differently than under Biden to say so, and some were used the same, or are used the same. So yeah, I'm not gonna say technology is neutral necessarily, but I'm gonna say that some are more neutral than others. Thank you very much all. Um, it was a very fruitful and interesting discussion. And uh, we will close this uh, panel C on artificial intelligence on behalf of Under the Viral Shadow uh, online international conference and we will move on to our closing final chapter therefore I would like to in um, invite Regina Rapp and Christian Delutz uh, next to me and we will have maybe like a one minute uh, break to set up our system and then we will be back <laughs>